These statues here at the Memorial to the Victim of Communism reflects what happens when people lose sight of what it means to be made in the image of God. Things get out of balance. Some people are treated poorly like animals, while others are lifted up and treated like gods. We lose sight of both the humility and the dignity that God intends for us to understand about being made in his image. And it doesn't really matter what the system is, because you see, when an ideology becomes an idol, it will eventually lead to insanity. It will lead to the mistreatment of people and to all kinds of atrocities. Because when we take something that God has designed and we put our own ideas, even if they may be good ideas, in place of his rightful reign, bad things happen and humanity will suffer. In the opening verses of the Bible, we find the core answer to the question, who we are. God says that you and I were made in his image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That truth holds the key for understanding ourselves, seeing others properly, discovering our purpose, and fulfilling our destiny. All that we are is caught up in a correct understanding of what it means to be made in God's image. But most of us have very little idea of what that really means. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to explore what the significance of being created in God's image means and how it points to God's plan of restoration and ultimately to the purpose of our life that brings true meaning. When we understand this concept, of what it means to be created in the image of God and to reflect his image, the pieces of life begin to come together. Now, last week, specifically, we explored God's will for our life. His purpose for you and me is for us to become more and more like Jesus Christ so that his likeness is reflected through our attitudes, through our actions, through our words, through our deeds, through how we treat others and how we reflect his character. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, spells it out. It says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, to be molded, to be shaped, to become like him, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. To be conformed to the image of Jesus, God's Son, means that God's purpose and calling in our life is to make us and to restore us to be like Jesus. Jesus is fully God, so there are ways that we can never accurately reflect him. But Jesus also became fully human, and so there are attributes that we can share, that we can reflect with God that will point to a correct picture of who God is. There are some attributes that belong to God alone. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit share these characteristics, but they belong only to God. For instance, God is omnipresent. There's no place in heaven or on earth that is apart from his presence. Likewise, God is omniscient. He knows everything. There is nothing that is hidden from his sight. Furthermore, God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. There's nothing that is beyond his power and ability and strength, which means that God cannot fail. Furthermore, God is immutable. This means that God does not change. Everything he does reflects his character. He is always faithful. What he has promised will happen, and we can count on God in every circumstance. Furthermore, God is eternal. He has always been. He will always be. In Christ Jesus, we are given everlasting life through faith in him and what he did in his death, burial, and resurrection. But our life had a beginning point. We are created beings. But God is not created. He is the creator, and he is eternal. Furthermore, God is sovereign. He is in control. 
He is the owner of absolutely everything, including you and me and everything about us. We belong to him and we owe him our worship and our obedience. Also, God is judge. Only God has the knowledge, the wisdom, and the right to judge others. This is why Romans 14 verses 10 through 13 says this, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue confess to God. So each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. That idea, that concept is so important. Because we need to recognize if we do not reflect the character and nature of God accurately, or if we seek to take his rightful place, others will have a distorted view of God, of what he is like. When we seek to judge others, we are seeking to take God's rightful place. Now, each of those, his omnipotence, his omniscience, his power, his sovereignty, his judgeship, all of those are unshared attributes that belong to God alone. But there are many other attributes of God that we are called to reflect because we were made in his image. So what are we to reflect as image bearers of God? Number one, the reflection we are to make as image bearers begins with holiness. God is absolutely separate from anything that is evil. And we are to mirror God when we hate sin and love holiness by repenting of our own sin, fighting against sin in our lives and in the world. God calls us to be holy as he is holy. Out of love for God, we want to be an accurate reflection of him. We do not earn favor with God through doing good things, but we are to reflect his likeness to the world around us. Put another way, character matters. How we live must be consistent with what we say we believe. Otherwise, we're presenting a distorted reflection of who God is and who he has called us to be. Secondly, we are to reflect the attribute of love. God alone is perfectly good and loving, and he alone is the source for all goodness and all love. But we are to mirror God when we love God for himself with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength, and when we love our neighbor as ourself. Also, we are to reflect God's image in truth. God is the source of all truth. He is the embodiment of truth. This is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth isn't just a concept, it's a person. When we mirror God, we believe his biblical truth, and we speak truthfully to others as an act of worship. Furthermore, we're to reflect the righteousness of God. God does not conform to a standard of, of right and wrong, but rightness flows out of his character. And our understanding of wrong flows from that which is contrary to who he is. We mirror God as we fight oppression, injustice, and evil. When we pursue justice, especially for those who are without power, who are vulnerable or defenseless or afflicted, we're reflecting the very heart and nature of God. Another attribute that's incredibly important that we are to reflect is mercy. God does not give some people what they deserve because he is loving and gracious. Aren't you thankful for that? I know God has not given me what I deserve because what I deserve is hell. But God has graciously shown mercy to me and rescued me from my own sin. We are to mirror his mercy by forgiving others who sin against us and to, good, to do good to those who do evil in an effort to bring them to repentance. Furthermore, we're to reflect the attribute of beauty. God himself is beautiful and all his creation reflects his beauty. God made men and women in his image and likeness 
to also create works of beauty. Artistry is designed to be a reflection of the beauty of God. We mirror God when we create and enjoy beauty in holy ways, such as caring for his creation. Another attribute that we are to reflect is God's faithfulness. God can be relied upon. He keeps his promises. His word is true. And we are called to reflect his faithfulness. When we make a promise, we are to keep it. We are to be faithful to others even when they offend us as an expression of God's faithfulness to us. We are to mirror each of these characteristics of God in such a way that others will see who he truly is. We are called to become more and more like Jesus Christ, to be conformed and molded into his likeness because he is the exact representation of who God is. Maybe a good way to, to illustrate this is uh, if you at home, if you have a coin, pull out a coin, whether it's a, maybe a 50 crown uh, coin or a 10 crown coin or, or even a euro if you have one of those, and take a look at it for a moment. Chances are your coins are, are like mine. This one's getting kind of dirty and, and worn out. Now, the interesting thing is, even though it's, it's dirty and tarnished, it's still worth 10 crowns. I can use it and go and, and, and buy something with it, although you can't get a whole lot for 10 crowns, but it still has its original value, even though it's tarnished in its image. And the more it's circulated, the more tarnished it becomes. This is a picture of what sin does to our life. We were created with a value, with God's image imprinted on us. And yet our sin has scarred and tarnished and stained our lives. But Jesus Christ is completely different from us. When coins are made, when they first um, make the mint that, and the form in order to, to put the imprint on a piece of metal and make it a coin, they begin the first... Um, pieces of metal that come off of that minting process are proof coins. And in the case of proof coins, they use a precious metal. They'll either use gold or silver or platinum. And when they take that coin, because it's the first one off of the press and they use it in a precious metal, it comes out with a very different sense of value. It, collectors want to collect proof coins because of their purity, because the image that is imprinted on them is absolutely perfect, and because the value that they have will not tarnish or fade because they're made of a precious metal. In a sense, that's the difference between us and Jesus. Jesus is the exact image of God. He is the proof of who he is. He is the evidence of his character and of his nature. We, on the other hand, are like those coins that have been in circulation for a while. Life, and especially sin, has scarred the image of God in us. But when we come to Jesus, he restores us. He not only cleans up our sin and makes us right with God, he begins to transform who we are so that we reflect more and more his nature. That's why God calls us to be conformed to the image of his Son. In the Bible, the term that's used to describe this process is called sanctification. And it simply means that we are becoming more and more who God saved us to be. The hope of the gospel in our sanctif sanctification is not just that we would make better choices and have a blessed life. Rather, it is for us to become better people, better reflections of who Jesus Christ truly is. The reflection that we are to make is God's reflection and not our own. We frequently pray, Lord, what should I do? Uh, let us learn instead to start praying, Lord, who do you want me to be? How can I reflect you more accurately in my attitudes, in the decisions that I make, in the way that I treat others, in the love that I have for you, the service that I do in your name, to benefit others, help me to reflect you, transform me, and make me more like Jesus. This is to be who we are, not just what we do. And in that, there is a key that is incredibly important. 
Many people seek self-help rather than sanctification. And there's a great difference between the two. Self-help seeks to have people make better decisions about their life so that they can be more comfortable. In essence, self-help is selfish. It's about us. Sanctification, on the other hand, seeks to transform us into more and more the likeness of Christ so that we look like who he is. Sanctification is not about us. It's about reflecting who God is and showing the greatness of his character. And the result is radically different. We can be comfortable when we make better choices. We'll have less bad consequences. But the reward that comes from being sanctified is incredible joy. That brings us secondly to the reason we are to bear God's image. And the reason is love. Jesus put it this way in John 15, verses 9 through 11. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Love is the motivation for us to be different, to be conformed to the image of Christ. Notice how Jesus begins. He starts with his motive. He gives a command that we are to keep his commandments, but first he reveals his own motive. He says, as the Father loves me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. What that means is live there. That is the the place, the oasis that we are to continually go to, to have a reservoir of life within us. Jesus is calling us to be like him and to share his motivation. What motivated him to serve, to sacrifice himself? It was the Father's love for him. And we are to be motivated by exactly the same thing, God's love for us. We will never accurately reflect God's character until we abide in God's love, till we live there on a daily basis. In the weeks ahead, we're going to look at what, it, what aspects we are to reflect of God's character and how to live that out on a practical basis. But we must begin with the right motive. It's not to try to earn favor with God, but it is to grow in our union with him and in our understanding of his incredible love. So how does God love you? When you think about God's love for you, what really comes to mind? Maybe another question to ask is, if you're dead honest, what do you believe God really thinks about you? Do you believe that he's frequently or continually disappointed in you? Or do you believe that he loves you as his child? Yes, he sees the wrong that we do. He sees the sins that we commit. But that's why he sent Jesus, to not only save us, but to transform us. A passage that I often refer to because it's one that has has become so central to my understanding of God's love is found in Isaiah 43. Let me read this to you. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. In the passage, God begins with the instruction to fear not. It's a reflection of what later we'll discover in the scripture where it says that true love casts out fear. Understanding God's true love for us as his adopted children through Jesus Christ sets us free from fear. Secondly, we'll see something that is incredibly powerful. Jacob and Israel are named here, but they're the same person. Jacob, his name means cheater. It was his name before his personal encounter with God. Israel, on the other hand, means God prevails. And that is the name that he had after his encounter, after he wrestled with God at Peniel. Jacob means 
cheater. If you remember the Bible story, he is given that name because he reached up and grabbed the ankle of his brother as he's being born. And then throughout his life, he proved that cheater really was his character. He swindled his brother out of his birthright, out of his inheritance. But that was his name before his personal encounter with God. Israel, on the other hand, means God prevails. And that is the name that God gave to him, not his birth name, but the name that God chose for him after his encounter with God, when he wrestled with God at Peniel. Now, here's, here's where I think that means, where is an illustration we can draw for our own life. God not only sees who you are, who you were born, who you are in your natural state, he sees who you will become. In fact, the scripture tells us that he has a name for us, a name he has chosen that he's given to no one else. We read about that in the book of Revelation. But here's what we need to take away with that. God's version of you wins. His vision for your life is so much better than anything you could come up with on your own, any plans that you could make. When we trust ourselves to him, When we come out, when we wrestle with God and surrender so that God prevails and we say, God, your life is, um, my life is yours. I give it to you. He begins a process of transforming us into who he created us to be and who Jesus has saved us to be. Isn't that good news? Let's look at verse two. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames will not consume you. What he's saying is, yes, life is going to be hard. You're going to encounter times when you feel the flood of hurt rising all the way up to your chin. But the Lord says, I'm with you. I will protect you. You are not alone. Fear not. Life is going to have trials. But God promises that those trials will not overtake you. He is our Savior, and He will be with us. Notice also, in verse 1, He says, He created you, O Israel. He formed you, O Jacob. Isaiah's first audience is the children of Israel. But that's not the extent to whom God is speaking. If we look at verse 7, we see that he expands this to each and every person who is called by his name. So the promises that we see here are for us as well. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. God invites us into his love and calls us by his name to be his image bearers. You see there in that little verse Three things that are very similar are all said, being created, being made, being formed. The first word he uses in the original language for create is the word bara, and it means something new of its kind. When God says, I created or bara, it means he caused something new to come about by his omnipotent power and wisdom. It is something distinct from everything else that has gone before it. Also, it says that God formed us, and he formed us for a personal relationship with himself. The word translated in Isaiah 43, 7 for formed is the Hebrew word yatsar, and it literally means handcrafted. Understand this, the, the Bible's account of creation shows that the rest of creation, God spoke into being, but with humanity, He formed us. He handcrafted us with his own hands. Genesis 2 verse 7 says it this way. Then the Lord God formed man out of the dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. The idea behind formed is that God formed us with his own hands, much like a potter forms the clay. God only made you a special creation. He handcrafted you. Isn't that incredible? But there's more. Isaiah 43, 7 adds an additional word. It says this, God made us as well. And the Hebrew word there is asah. 
And that word means to complete or to finish. Humanity completes God's creation. We are the crowning deed of what he has made. In humanity, we are the intersection between the material and the spiritual. And we are made to reflect the amazing beauty of who God is. For us as believers, we are also a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That new creation in Christ Jesus not only saves us, it is how the image of God is restored in us as well so that we can reflect who he is. In humanity, earth touches heaven. This is why we mean so much to God. Humanity was created by God for several reasons. First of all, to know the greatness of God. Only humanity has a God consciousness. God created us to know him, to have a relationship with him. Not just to know about him, but to be united with him through faith in his son. Knowing God is the first dimension of glorifying God. Make it your pursuit to know him. And the way that we do that is to spend time in his word every day. To think about it, to read it, to meditate on it. To allow what he has written, what he has spoken to us, to penetrate our hearts and minds in such a way that we know God more intimately. We are created not only to know God, but to commune personally with God. Each person, there is a desire and a capacity to listen to the voice of God. God not only made us to know him, but to enjoy him. God has chosen to take up his residency in us through his Holy Spirit. He desires you and he calls you his own. Thirdly, we were created to serve God's work. Remember, God's first assignment to Adam was to care for his creation. God cares about the work that we do. He calls us to be co-laborers with Christ in bringing people to a knowledge of salvation. Jesus has called us to be his ambassadors, to be his witnesses of his new creation. Well, fourthly, we are to reflect the greatness of God to all of creation. Jesus Christ is our redemption. He is the one who transforms us, but we are called to be God's revelation of his glory. Do you see how important that is? Jesus is the only one who could rescue us. But we can reveal who Jesus is through our life, through our actions, through our attitudes, and through our witness. But again, this is all motivated by love. God cherishes you. He loves you. He is restoring us to his likeness. And that is where we find purpose, security, identity, and relationship. And it's all found in Jesus Christ. What's the reward that we have as image bearers? Let's go back to Isaiah 43 and let's draw out just a couple more things from this incredible passage. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Do you see what he's saying there? I want you to make it personal as you read that. God personally is calling you by name and he says that you are mine. He says you belong to him. You are his possession. And now with that, it means he desires you. Have you looked at it from that standpoint? Do you believe that God not only loves you, but that he desires you? He desires to make you his own. Look at verse two. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. God promises to be with us in trials. He promises to protect us from being overwhelmed. And then he goes on in verse three to say this. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. God reminds you 
that he is the one who rescues us. And he also reminds us that he has purchased us at the cost of another's life. This verse points to what God would eventually do himself through his son in providing a ransom to buy us back from sin and death. Look at verse four though. Here's why God has done it. Here's why he has given his son as a ransom. Verse four, because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. Wow, isn't that amazing? God says you are precious. He says you are honored. This means that when God looks at you, he says, that's my child. I'm proud of you. He loves you and he promises to care for you. In verse four, excuse me, in verse five, he goes on and promises to care for your family, for your children. You can trust them into his hands as well. This is God's love for you. This is the love that we are to live in. This is the love that Jesus said that he abided in. He would abide in the Father's love and now we are to abide in that same love. And in that resource, we have the power to be transformed by his work into image bearers that reflect his likeness. This is our new identity in Christ Jesus as new creations rescued through Jesus Christ. But what about our responsibility as image bearers? Well, if we look down just a few more verses through uh, Isaiah 43, verses 10 through 12, it says this, "'You are my witnesses,' declares the Lord, "'and my servant whom I have chosen, "'that you may know and believe me "'and understand that I am he. "'Before me no God was formed, "'nor shall there be any after me. "'I, I am the Lord, "'and beside me there is no Savior. "'I declared and saved and proclaimed "'when there was no strange God among you, "'and you are my witnesses,' declares the Lord, and I am God. Twice in these verses, we're referred to as witnesses. Witnesses here means that we're the evidence. You and I are designed to be the evidence of God's love, God's nature, and his character. This is our calling. This is why we are to reflect God's character and his nature accurately so that others will be able to respond and say, the Lord, the Lord is God, and I will honor him. We are to be evidence of him. We are called to look like Jesus so that others will see Jesus. We are to live in his love as Jesus lived in the Father's love. And from that deep well of joy, we are to become more and more a reflection of his goodness. Sin has distorted us. But God is restoring us so that we can look and reflect the greatness and beauty of our incredible God. God calls us to live out of this new identity. He calls us to live and dwell in his love so that we can accurately reflect him. Would you make it your prayer to live in God's love to meditate on these verses here from Isaiah 43, to ask the Lord to help you make them a reality in your life. Not just words that you read off of a page, but a reality that you live so that it can be the resource that God taps into to bring transformation into your life. And then would you willingly submit yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to reflect you accurately. Show me areas of my life that are distorting in the view of others who you truly are. Help me to look more and more like Jesus. I receive this as the calling you have placed upon my life. I am called to reflect Jesus Christ. Help me to do so. That's the mission. That's the purpose God has given us for our life. And in the pursuit of that mission, you will find the greatest joy. You will find a contentment you will find a peace that is deeper and more overwhelming than anything you could ever imagine. God has called us to greatness. He has called us to be a reflection of Him. 
May the Lord show us how to accurately reveal His goodness and His greatness to others.